Good morning, dear students. Uh, my name is Farhan Mazar, and the subject today we are studying is Cambridge IGCSC uh, Physics. <clears throat> the code of the subject is 0625, and this is extended physics, and we are going to attempt a uh, multiple choice question. The paper we have selected is February, March 2023. The time allowed for this paper is 45 minutes and there are 40 MCQs related to this subject. So let's start today's uh, paper. So the paper in front of you is uh, February, March 2023. This is a physics 062522 paper. This is extended physics and uh, the paper is a multiple choice question uh, it, we have multiple choice questions in it this is cambridge igcsc okay so we are going to attempt the first question he says uh, which which list contains two scalar quantities and two uh, vector quantities two scalar quantities and two uh, vector quantities okay so if you look at here force is a vector velocity is a vector distance is a mass and distance is a scalar quantity mass is a scalar quantity so i think b is the right choice let's check question number uh, we are talking about the question number one and my dear students question number one b is the right choice so we have to tell uh, we have to pick up list in which two quantities are vector two quantities are scalar so b is the right choice okay so here we have question number two and it says the diagram shows the speed time graph for a car so here we have a speed time graph on the y-axis we have speed on the x-axis we have time so which road describes the motion of the car at the point x and at the point y here, the speed of the car is increasing uh, uniformly, means the acceleration is uniform. Here, the speed of the car is constant. It's not changing. Okay, so at X, the moving with the changing speed and at the Y, moving with a constant speed. Okay, so I think the D is the right choice, sir. Question number two, D is the right choice. Question number two, D is the right choice. Question number three, four objects are moving in a straight line. The table shows the distance moved by each object in each second of its motion. Which object is moving with a constant non-zero acceleration means acceleration is constant but it is not zero it has certain acceleration in it which means that the speed is gradually and uniformly increasing so here try to understand this data so distance moved in the first second distance moved in the second second distance moved in the third second and distance moved in the fourth second so in all the options the time is one second. So you can find the speed here. This will be distance divided by time. So it will be five divided by one. That will be five. And here the speed will be five divided by one because second second means one second. So the distance moved in the second second is five meters and the time taken is one second. So here the speed will be five divided by one, distance divided by time, and that will be five. Here again in the third second, the speed uh, the speed will be distance divided by time, and that will be um, um, distance divided by time, and that will be five divided by one. That will be five. So again here it will be five divided by one, and that will be five. So here the speed is five. Here the speed is five. Here the speed will be five. Here the speed will be five. Okay. So the speed is constant. Here, the speed is constant. Okay, now let me show you. I have done this on a paper for the B. 
And in the first second, in the B option, the distance traveled is five. In the second second, the distance traveled is six. In the third option, in the third second, the distance traveled is seven. In the fourth second, the distance traveled is eight. So I will find out the speed in all the four seconds. And in the first second, the distance is five. The time is one second. So it will be five by one. That will be five meters per second. In the second second, the distance traveled is six seconds, six meters. And the time taken will be one. So one second. So it will be six by one. That will be six meters per second. The, in the third second, the time is one second. The distance covered is seven. So the speed here is seven meter per second. Then in the fourth second, the distance traveled is eight meter. The time is one second. So that speed will be eight meter per second. If you look at these speeds, the speeds are changing. And here the increase in that speed is uniform. So in the option B, the body is moving with a constant acceleration, which is not zero. So I think B is the answer. You can find the speed for each second uh, in all other options, but um, B is the right option. Okay, so let's check question number three. B is the right option, sir. I hope you have understood this question. Okay, so we are going to the next question. The next question is question number four. The drag force on a car increases with the speed. At the 20 meter per second, the total drag force is 400 newton. The mass of the car is 1200 kg and the driving force is constant at 700 newton. Now you see the 700 newton is the driving force which is constant and throughout our observation that will remain constant. The drag force is 400 Newton. So the resultant force, drag force is a friction, it's, it's like friction. So the resultant force will be the driving force minus the drag force. So that will be 700 Newton minus 400 Newton. So that will be 300 Newton. So the, the resultant force is 300 Newton. And their question is, which statement about the acceleration of the car at 20 meter per second is correct? Okay. Hmm. So, you know, the resultant force, uh, once we know the resultant force, we can find the acceleration. F is equals to ma. This is Newton's second law of motion. 300 is equals to 1200 multiply a, 1200 kg. And a will be equals to 300 divided by 1200. That will be... Uh, 3 by 12, and that will be 0 0.25 meter per second square. So the acceleration is 0 0.25 meter per second square. Because uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the acceleration is 0 0.25 meter per second, but will decrease as the time passes. Okay, so because your speed is increasing, you see A and B option, uh, the 0 0.25 meter per second square, but will increase as the time passes. You know, as you will gain speed because the body is accelerating. So as the body will accelerate, uh, the speed of the body will increase. So the drag force will also increase. So due to that, the resultant force continuously will decrease. And due to that, the acceleration in the body that will gradually decrease. So I think A is the right option. Right now, the acceleration is 0 0.25 meter per second uh, per second square, and it will gradually decrease. So we think that A is the option. Question number four, A is the right option, sir. Okay, so we are going to the next question. That is question number five. A rectangular swimming pool is 50 meter long and 25 meter wide. It contains water at a depth of two meter. The density of the water is 1,000 kg per meter cube. What is the mass of the water in the pool? So you know the length, you know the width, and you know the depth of the body of the water, which is in the swimming pool. So we can find out the volume of that water. We know the density of that water, so we can find the mass. Uh, first of all, I will find out the volume of that water, and you know that is in a rectangular shape. 
rectangular uh, prism. So it will be length into width into height. That will be 50 to 25 into 2. That will be 2,500 meter cube. You know, the density is equals to mass divided by volume. So mass will be equals to density multiply volume. And density is 1,000 kg per meter cube. The volume is 2,500 meter cube. So when you multiply them, you get uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 5, 2. So 25, and then we have 2,500,000 kg. 2,500,000 kg. And I think D is the right option, sir. Question number five, D is the right option. Okay, so uh, we will go to the next question. And in the next question, we have, he says, and question number six. An object is rising vertically at constant speed through water. There are three vertical forces acting on it. The weight, W, the drag force, D, and the upward force, U. Which diagram shows the magnitude and direction of the vertical forces acting on the object? So this object is basically rising vertically at a constant speed. This word is important, constant speed. So the upward and downward forces, they will be balanced. And there are three forces acting, so the object. So an upward force is U, the upward force will be U, okay. And the weight will be acting downward, okay. And because the body is moving upward, the drag force, which is friction, that will be also downward. So the drag force is represented with the D. So we are looking for that diagram in which the weight and the drag force are downward and the, 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 the force, upward force is U that is in the upward direction. And downward and upward forces, they should be equal to each other because the body is moving with a constant speed, which means that the body has zero resultant force. So which diagram? Which diagram? Okay, U is upward, it's 3 Newton. Downward forces are 1 plus 2, 3 Newton. So I think D is the right option, sir. Question number 6, D is the right option, and our answer is right. Okay, so we are going to the next question, and that is question number 7. He says, two boys of equal weight sit on one side of the seesaw as shown. Their father of the weight 1000 Newton sits on the other side. The seesaw is balanced and, and is being used so that it moves up and down. During one part of the cycle, the father descends through a distance of 40 centimeter. At the same time, the boy nearest the pivot rises through 20 centimeter while the other boy rises through 80 centimeter. What is the weight of each boy? Okay, so here uh, one thing is uh, very important that two boys of equal weight. So both of these, their weights are W and W, okay? His weight I know is 1000 Newton. He goes down. So there is some loss in the gravitational potential energy. The loss in the gravitational potential energy here will be equal to the gain in the gravitational potential energy of these two boys. So this is the main idea. Okay. So let me show you. So the loss in the gravitational potential energy of the boys. So here is the gravitational potential energy of the of the father, and that will be equals to the gravitational potential energy gained by the boys. Okay, so the gravitational potential energy gained by the boys, that will be equals to the gravitational potential energy lost by the father. So it will be weight into the height, so the, the gravitational potential energy lost, that is 1000 multiplied 40 divided by 100. Why I'm dividing with 100? I'm converting the centimeters into meters. So 
1000 multiplied 40 divided by 100, that will be equals to the, the gain in the gravitational potential energy. That will be W multiplied 20 divided by 100. This boy rises at 20 centimeters up and the other boy rises 80 centimeters above. So uh, his gain in the gravitational potential energy will be W into 80 divided by 100. So it will be 400 equals to 0 0.2 W plus 0 0.8 W. So 1 W will be equals to 400 Newton. So the weight of one boy is 400 Newton. So the weight of one boy is 400 Newton. So we think B is the choice. Question number seven, B is the right choice, sir. It's right, sir. Okay, so we are going to the next question. Uh, ask question number eight. <clears throat> a student measures the length of a spring. She then attaches different weights to the spring. She measures the length of the spring for each weight. The table shows her results. So here we have a table in which we have the weight and the length. So uh, this is called the L0. Why we call it the L0? Because this is unstretched length. This is unstretched. When there is no load, the length is called unstretched length of the spring. So their question is, what is the extension of the spring with a weight of 3 Newton? So when you have hung 3 Newton, this is called the length. You know the extension is equals to L minus L0. This is the extension. Their question is, what is the extension of the spring with a weight of 3 Newton attached to it? So I can easily calculate. Uh, and the extension is equals to the extension is equals to L minus L naught. That will be 533 uh, minus 520. And that will be 13 millimeter. So when you hung a, 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 a 3 Newton weight, the, the extension will be 13 millimeter. I said Newton. It's 13 millimeter. 13. D is the right option. So you can see question number 8. D is the right option, sir. Question number eight, D is the right option. So we have question, uh, sorry, we have question number uh, nine. Uh, the momentum of a body is changed by a force acting on it for a period of time. Which action increases the change in momentum? The change in the momentum that is represented with the delta P that is equals to the resultant force uh, multiply with the time uh, that resultant force is acting on that body. So doubling the force and having the halving the time. So if you double it and half it, the the effect will be cancelled. There will be the change in the momentum will be uh, remain the same. Doubling the force for the same time. Yes, if you double the force, you make it two times and you keep it the same, the change in the momentum will also become double. Halving both the forces and the time. If you half it, you half it. The change in the momentum will become one by four. If you having the force and doubling the time, if you half the force and double the time, the effect will be canceled. The change in the momentum will remain the same. So I think if you make the force double, if you make it uh, 2F and you keep the time same, then the change in the momentum, that will also become double. F into T will be changing momentum when, because you have made the F two times. So the change in the momentum will become two times the change in the momentum previous value. So I think question number 9B is the right answer, sir. That is the right answer you can see on your screen. And okay, so we are going to the next question. The equation used to find the change in gravitational potential energy of an object can be written as, you know, the change in the gravitational potential energy is basically M, G, and H where M is the mass of the body, G is the gravitational field strength, and H is the change in the height of the object. Okay, so their question is where the delta EP is the change in the gravitational energy and delta H is the change in height, which row gives the quantity Y. So Y is basically the mass 
and z is the gravitational potential uh, gravitational field strength so i think a is the right answer sir question number 10 a is the right option and it is the right option sir so uh, we are done with question number 10 okay question number 11 a machine has a power input of 200 watt and a useful output energy of one kilojoule in six minutes. What is the efficiency of the machine? Okay, so efficiency is uh, useful output energy divided by total input energy multiply 100. So input energy is not given. The input power is given. We know the time. We can find out the input energy. Input energy will be the input power multiply the time but the time must be taken in seconds. The time given is six minutes. So I will multiply the six with the 60 and that will give me uh, the, okay. So here we have the input energy will be equal to the input power multiplied time. So the input power is 200 watts multiply six multiply 60. So you will have 72,000 joules. That's the input energy. The output energy is given. That is one kilojoule, which means 1,000 joules. Efficiency is equal to useful output energy divided by the input energy multiply 100. So it will be 1,000 divided by 72,000 multiply 100. And that will be 1.388%, 1 1 which is when you round it off, it will be one percent Four percent, one point four percent, one point four percent means the C is the choice. Question number eleven, C is the right choice, sir. This is the solution of that question. I hope you understand. Question number twelve, what is the unit of the power? You know the unit of the power is there are two units. One is joules per second and the other unit is watt in the options we have watt here so this is the answer question number 12 d is the option sir which is right okay question number 13 the diagram shows a rectangular block of the weight 16 newton it is resting on a flat surface what is the pressure at the base of the block due to its weight? You know, we can find out the pressure that will be equal to the weight divided by the area of that face which is touching the ground. Okay, the area of that face will be 4 multiply 5. So very easily I can find the pressure. The pressure will be equal to weight divided by area. That will be 16 Newton divided by 4 centimeter multiply 5 centimeter. So that's 16 by 20 centimeter, 16 Newton divided by 20 centimeter square. So the answer will be 0 0.8 Newton per centimeter square. 0 0.8 Newton per centimeter square. So we think question number 13, C is the right option. And you can see in the marking scheme that C is the right option, sir. This is the solution. Question number 14. An oil tank has a base of area 2.5 meters square and is filled with the oil to a depth of 1.2 meters. The density of the oil is 800 kg per meter cube. What is the force exerted on the base of the tank due to the oil? You know, the pressure of the oil, we can because it's a liquid, and the pressure of the oil is rho GH. Rho GH. Okay, so I can find out uh, the pressure is rho GH, and that's the pressure of a liquid. Because we know here, rho means the density of the oil, G means the gravitational field strength, and H means the depth of the liquid above the point of observation. So it is 800 multiplied 10 multiplied 1.2, that's 9600 Pascal. Now their question is, how much is the force applied? Their question is, what is the force exerted on the base of the tank due to the oil? 
Okay, so the force, the pressure is equal to force divided by area. The force will be equal to pressure multiply area, and that will be 9600 multiplied 2.5. So the force will be equal to uh, 24,000 Newton. 24,000 Newton. So I think D is the right option, sir. Question number 14. I think D is the right option, and it is the right option, sir. This is the solution, and here we go. Question number 15. A sample of gas is trapped in a rigid container. As the temperature of the gas is increased, the pressure increases. Which statement is not correct? Okay, so the a sample of the gas is trapped in a rigid container. As the temperature of the gas is increased, the pressure increases. So the volume is constant. Now, when the volume is constant, the pressure and the temperature, they are directly proportional to each other. If you will increase the temperature, the pressure will increase. Their question is, which statement is not correct? The gas molecules have greater kinetic energy. Yes, that is true. When you will increase the temperature, the kinetic energy of the gas molecules will increase. B option is, the gas molecules hits the walls of the container harder. Yes, that is also true because when they will be moving faster, they will have higher kinetic energy. So when they will collide with the walls of the container, they will hit harder. The gas molecules hit the walls of the container more frequently. That is true because now the molecules are moving faster. Their collision frequency with the walls of the container will increase. The D option is the gas molecules move further apart. That is wrong because the volume of the gas is constant. So we were looking for that statement, which is not correct. So D statement, the statement D, that is not correct. So 15, D is the option. And it is the option, sir. D is the right option for question number 15. Question number 16, he says, what happens when the temperature of a liquid increases? So when the temperature of a liquid will increase, the mass of the liquid increases. That's totally wrong. The mass of the liquid increases. That's wrong. Mass will not increase. C option is the volume of the liquid increases. That's possible. Making the liquid less, less dense. That's possible. The volume of the liquid increases, making the liquid more dense. That's wrong because the mass do not change. When you raise the temperature, the volume increases. So the density will decrease because the mass same, but the volume has increased. So the density will decrease. So question number 16, C is the right option, sir. C is the right option for question number 16. Okay. So next question is question 17, a bar of matter, which is a good thermal conductor, is heated at one end. What is the main method of transfer of thermal energy along the bar? You see, this bar is made of metal. In the metals, we have that uh, molecular vibration, but the main reason for conduction is that they have free electrons because we're talking about metal. And the free electrons, they can move from the hot end by absorbing the energy. They move and they flow to the cold end of the metal. So that happens, we call it the uh, free electron diffusion. So C is the right option, so transfer of electrons. Okay. That makes the metal a better conductor. C, question number 17. Question number 17, C is the right option, sir. Uh, question 18, a transverse wave moves along a rope. The diagram shows the position of the rope at one particular time. Which two label labeled points are one wavelength apart? One wavelength is the distance along the direction of the wave between the two consecutive points who are in the same phase. So this X, because this X is going upward and it is on the mean position, and this Z, this Z is also going upward 
and it is on the mean position. So X and Z, they both are in the same phase. Y is on the mean position, but the Y is not in the same phase because the Y will be going downward. So how do I know they are going upward or downward? Because what will happen with the point Z? Exactly what is behind the point Z, okay? So uh, X and Z, they both are in the same phase. They are consecutive points to each other in the same phase. So the distance between them, that will be one wavelength. X and Z, C is the option. Question number 18, C is the right option, sir. The light is trust, light, question 19. Light in transparent plastic meets a boundary with air. Light is transmitted into the air only if the angle marked theta in the diagram is greater than 36 degrees. What is the refractive index of the plastic? Okay, so if you draw a tangent here, if you draw a tangent here, you see if I draw a tangent here, this angle will be the angle of incidence in the dense medium. And this angle I can find out. The angle total here is 90. If this is 36, this will be 90 minus 36. Okay, so the angle of incidence will be 90 minus 36. That will be 54. And that is the critical angle. And um, the N will be equals to 1 by sine C where C is the critical angle, the angle in the dense medium. Uh, so 1 by sine 54, that will be 1 by 0 0.809, that is 1.2. So the refractive index is 1.2. So we think C is the right option, sir. C. Question number, this question was 19. Question number 19, C is the right option, sir. You can see this is the solution. Hopefully you understand this. Then we have here. He says, a thin, question number 20, a thin converging lens has a focal length F. Uh, an object O is placed to the left of the lens as shown. Okay. So where is the image formed and how does its size compare to the object? Okay. You can see this is the object and this is the first, uh, this is the focal point. The object is between the lens and the focal point. It is between the principal focus and the lens. So because the distance of the object is less than the focal length, here this converging lens will act like a magnifying glass and it will produce an enlarged virtual and erect image. And the image will be on the same side uh, as that the object is. So where is the image formed and how does this size? So the image formed will be here somewhere. The image formed will be here somewhere. This image will be uh, very large. It means we magnified and it will be erect and it will be virtual. So that is what happens in a magnifying glass. So they say uh, on the opposite side of the lens to the object, no. On the opposite side of the lens to the object, no on the same side of the lens as the object, yes. And larger than the object, yes. So I think C is the right option, sir. And because this is a magnified image, this is uh, this, this, this happens when the uh, convex lens is being used as a magnifying glass. So we think 20, the C is the right option, sir. And it is the right option. Okay, so uh, we are going to the next question and the next question coming up on your screen is question number 21. Which diagram shows what happens when a ray of light uh, passes through a prism? You see, when the white light will enter into the prism. So as it enters into the prism, the light will split into its colors. And when the light will emerge from the other phase, it will form a spectrum. Okay, so the angle here, which uh, it, it has shown, uh, if you draw a tangent here, uh, sorry, sorry, a normal here, the light will enter from the air into the uh, 
the dense medium, it will bend towards the normal. And when you draw a normal here, the light will bend away from the normal. So the D is the right option, sir. If you draw a normal here, the light when enter from air into the glass, it has bended towards the normal. When you draw a normal here, you will see that the light has bended away from the normal. So when the light entered here, the, it has split it into its colors. So D is the proper diagram, which is the right diagram. Hopefully you have seen this diagram many, many times in your textbook. So that was question number 21. And we think D is the option, sir. Yeah, the D is the right option, sir. So uh, here we have question number uh, 22. A television station, a TV station, transmits a signal to a television receiving dish. The television has an on-off indicator light. The television is switched on by a remote control, which changes the indicator light from red to green. The electromagnetic waves used in these actions has the longest wave length. Okay. So their question is, uh, which of the electromagnetic waves used here has the longest wavelength? So uh, from TV station to satellite, from satellite to dish, this is microwave, okay? So this, the wave used, the electromagnetic wave used is microwave here. And the... The, the the electromagnetic wave used to control the television by the remote control. This is a uh, infrared. Okay, this is infrared, and this is a uh, visible light. We are visible light. Okay, the colors you see. So which one of them has the longest wavelength? That is the question. You remember that electromagnetic spectrum? The code word is Ronald McDonald is very ugly except Gary. Okay, so we have here infrared. Okay, you have visible light here and you have microwaves. And you remember when you go down in this list, the wavelength decreases. So the longest wavelength is the microwaves. So I think A is the option. It's a very good question. A is the option. Question number 22A is the right option, sir. Okay, so we are going to the next question. And the next question is question number 22. Uh, sorry, 20, that was question number 22. Now we are on question number 23. A student makes a list of some applications of waves. So first application is medical scanning of the soft tissue. Okay. B, uh, question uh, two option, uh, the two number uh, application is sterilizing water. And the third is using sonar to calculate the ocean depth. This uh, sonar, uh, which application use ultrasound waves? Sonar is based on the ultrasound, ultrasound. And medical scanning of the soft tissues that is also being used, that uses ultrasound. Sterilizing of the water is not done by the ultrasound, okay? So one and three uses ultrasound, one and three. One and three only, that is C option. So let's check question number 23. C is the right option, sir. Question number, uh, we have 24. The diagram shows a bar magnet at rest on a smooth horizontal surface. A length of soft iron wire is held parallel to the magnet. The wire is released. What happens? Due to the electromagnetic, uh, sorry, due to the magnetic induction, what will happen? Here we have north. Here the south will be created. Here the north will be created. So in this piece of wire, soft iron wire, 
uh, the end which is near to the north, that will become south, and the end which is near to the south, that will become north. This is called magnetic induction. And due to this, this soft iron wire will be uh, attracted to this bar magnet. So what will happen basically that this bar magnet, uh, sorry, 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 this soft iron wire, that will start moving towards the magnet. So they say, what happens? The wire moves away from the magnet? No, it will be attracted to the magnet. And B, the wire moves towards the magnet. Yes, sir. B is the right option. The wire center stays in its first present position and the wire rotates about... No, 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 no. It does not rotate. So we think 24B is the option, sir. Question number 24B is the right option, sir. Question number 24, you can see B is the option. <clears throat> so now we are going to the next question that is question number 25 he says uh, which diagram shows the electric field pattern and direction around a positive point charge you see uh, in a positive point charge the electric field lines come out they fan out they radiate they come out so uh, I think A is the right option, sir. Very simple, straightforward question. Question number 25A is the right option, sir. Question number 26. A laboratory has a standard wire of known resistance. It also has other wires made from the same material as the standard wire, but of different lengths and diameters. Which wire would definitely have a resistance of less than the standard wire? So if you want the resistance to decrease, the length of the wire should be smaller and the diameter should be larger. Length should be shorter and the diameter should be larger. So I think C is the right option. It's a very straightforward question. Question number 26, C is the option, sir. That is the right option, sir. Okay, so we are going to the next question, which is question number 27. The graph shows the relationship between the current in a circuit component and the potential difference across it. The graph shows a straight section and a curved section here here remember uh, the current is on the y-axis the potential difference is on the x-axis the gradient here the slope or the gradient we call it so the gradient here that will be equals to uh, i by v i by v is basically one by r okay so the gradient of this graph is basically representing the reciprocal of the resistance. When the gradient of this graph is constant, when the graph is a straight line, the resistance is constant. And when the slope of this graph is gradually decreasing, it means the resistance is gradually increasing. The opposite is happening with the resistance whatever is happening to the slope here the slope is gradually decreasing it means the resistance is gradually increasing so the straight section means no change in the resistance and in the curved section means that the resistance is increasing so we think d is the option no change in the resistance in the straight section and in the curved section because the slope is decreasing which means that the resistance will be doing opposite so the resistance will be increasing so we think question number uh, 27, we think D is the option. Question number 27, D is the right option, sir. Uh, I hope you understand. Let me decrease the size so you can see the whole question number 27. Together, D is the right option. I hope you understand the idea also that how, how we concluded this. Okay, so here we have question number 28 on your screen. The diagram shows part of a circuit. Uh, what is the combined resistance of the resistors? Very simple. These two are, um, you know, uh, in series with each other. 
So I will find out their combined resistors because they are in series. So they will be simply added up. So 2 plus 1, that will be 3 ohm. Okay. Then that 3 ohm and this 4 ohm, they are in parallel to each other. So I will find their uh, combined resistance. Uh, the formula is 1 by R is equals to uh, 1 by R is equals to uh, uh, 1 by R1 plus 1 by R2, you can say. So first of all, I will find the R4, that is R1 plus R2, that is 2 plus 1, that is 3 ohm. Then 3 ohm and the 4 ohm, they are in uh, parallel to each other. So their equivalent resistance will be 1 by R equivalent equals to 1 by R4 plus 1 by R3. So 1 by R equivalent will be equals to 1 by 3 plus 1 by 4. And 1 by R equivalent will be equals to 4 plus 3, the whole thing divided by 12. So the R equivalent will be 1.7 ohm, 1.7 ohm. So this is the whole question. So the R equivalent for the whole circuit will be 1.7 ohm. 1.7 ohm. So we think C is the right option. Question number 28. C is the right option, sir. Okay. Now we have the next question. The next question is question number 29. He says, the diagram shows a circuit which includes two resistors and a battery. The voltmeter reads 6 volt. So what is the potential difference across the 30 ohm resistor? If you remember the potential divider, this is my R1. This is my R1. And this is my R2. And the uh, this will be the voltage of the battery here. And this V out is from the R1, across the R1. So if you remember the potential divider, the V out formula, if you remember that, I can show you. The V out from the R1, the formula will be R1, the divided by the total resistance of the circuit, multiply the voltage of the battery. So V out is 6 volt and R1 is 10 and the total resistance will be 10 by 30, 10 plus 30, sorry, into the voltage of the battery. So it will be 6 in equals to 10 divided by 40 into the voltage of the battery. So the voltage of the battery will be 6 multiplied 40 divided by 10 and that will be 24 volt. Okay. So the voltage of the battery will be 24 volt. So the battery is giving you 24 volt. So what is the voltage drop across the 30? So what is the voltage drop here? So out of 24, 6 volts are dropped here. So how much will be here? That will be 24 minus 6. And that will be 18 volt. So the voltage drop across the R2, that will be 18 volt. And we think C is the right option, sir. And C, this is the solution. 18 volt, C is the option. Question number uh, 29, I think. Yeah, C is the option, sir. Question number 29C is the right option. This is how it is done. Okay. Question number we have here, question number 30. A wire is moved down in a direction perpendicular to the magnetic field. So obviously the EMF will be induced in the that wire. Three changes are suggested. The speed of the movement of the wire is increased. When you will move this wire faster, the EMF induced in the wire, that will become larger. The magnetic field strength is decreased. If you decrease the magnetic field, the EMF induced will decrease. The direction of the magnetic field is reversed. And uh, When you reverse the direction of magnetic field, only the, only the direction of the EMF induced, that will change. Which changes increase the electromotive force induced in the wire? Okay. So this will, when you move this wire faster, the EMF induced will become larger. And rest of the two options given, they do not, uh, in fact, uh, they do not increase the EMF induced. So only one, I think B is the option. This is the only B. Question number 30, B is the option. Question number 30, B is the option, sir. 
So question number uh, 30, uh, I think B is the right option, sir. So we have the next question, question number 31. He says, a wire is moved across a magnetic field. This causes an induced current in the wire. The induced current interacts with the magnetic field to produce a force on the wire. In which direction is this force? You know, this is the Lenz's law and the induced EMF due to that, the force experienced by that wire uh, due to the interaction of that wire and the magnetic field will be such. It will try to uh, oppose the cause which is producing, which is inducing that EMF. Because you have my, uh, you have moved the wire uh, across the magnetic field. Okay. He has not told us the direction. Okay. Uh, in the direction of the current? No. In the direction of the movement of the wire? It will be opposite to that movement. In the opposite direction to the current? No. In the opposite direction to the movement of the wire? Yes. This is Lenz's law. D will be the option. Yeah. D is the option, sir. Question number 32. A 100% efficient step-down transformer has a primary voltage and primary current. Which row compares the secondary voltage and the secondary current? So this is a step-down transformer. So the, the primary voltage will be larger and the secondary voltage will be less. So the primary voltage will be greater than the secondary voltage. Because it's a step-down transformer. Primary voltage will be greater than the secondary voltage. Or, or you can say, uh, because step-down, in, in, he says, uh, which row compares the secondary voltage with the uh, voltage in the primary and the, the voltage in the secondary will be less than the voltage in the primary. And the current is opposite. The, so the current in the uh, secondary will be more than the current in the primary. It's a step down transformer. The secondary will have less voltage, but more current as compared to the primary. <clears throat> so we think C choice. Question number 32, C is the right option, sir. Question 33. The scattering of alpha particles by a thin metal foil sports the nuclear model of an atom. Why are alpha particles used rather than neutrons? Uh, because they always travel more slowly? No. Because they are heavier. Because they are larger in diameter. Because they have a positive charge. We have not used, uh, means we have not used neutrons. The mass of the neutrons and the alpha particles, uh, they are comparable. Okay. We use the alpha particles because they have positive charge on them. Why we have not used neutrons? Because alpha particles have positive charge on them. They are talking about a uh, Martian Geiger and Martian experiment in which we bombard the alpha particles on a thin gold foil. Why we use alpha particles? Because the alpha particle has positive charge. So D is the option. Question number 33, D is the right option, sir. An iron nucle nucleide is represented by the symbol uh, iron Fe 2656. Which statement about the nucleus of this iron nuclide are correct? The nucleus contains 56 neutrons. That is wrong. Uh, the nucleon number is 30. That is also wrong. The nucleon number is uh, 56. The proton number is uh, 26. This is right. So third option is right. So this is D. 34D is the right option, sir. You can see from the marking scheme. 
a sample of radioactive isotope has an initial rate of emission of 128 counts per minute. Okay, this is the initial count rate. And uh, half-life of four days. How long will it take for the rate of emission to fall to 32 counts per minute? Okay, so from 128, the count rate wants to go down to 32. So when one half life will pass from 128, it will go to uh, 64. And from another half life will pass and this will go from 64 to 32. So you can see for this change, uh, it need two half lives. One half life is four days. Now there are two half lives. So two into four, that will be eight days. So eight days, eight days, eight days, eight days. So I think C is the option, sir. 35, C is the option. 35, C is the right option, sir. This is the solution. 36, question number 36. Several scientists are working in a laboratory. The scientists are experimenting with sources which emit ionizing radiation. Each scientist is given a list of safety rules. Three of the rules are shown. So, uh, Baba? so, uh, so, uh, this is which is emitting ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation can be alpha, it can be beta. Uh, each scientist is given a list of safety rules. Keep at least two meters away from other people. Uh, from other people, you don't have to. Do not stay longer than four hours per day in the body. That can be. Stay behind the lead line screen. That can also be. Which safety rules are for protection against the effects of ionizing radiation? So, one, I don't think that you have to stay away from your partners. Uh, who are working with you, two and three can be the answers. I think D answer, I think D is the right option, sir. But let me check. Question number 36, D is the right option, sir. Question number 36, D is the right option. Which data is needed to calculate the average orbital speed of satellite around a planet this is question number 37 which data is needed to calculate the average orbital speed of a satellite around a planet okay so the formula for the orbital speed is 2 pi and r divided by the time this is the formula for the orbital speed here this is the radius of that orbit and t is the time which is taken to complete that orbit the distance of the satellite from the center of the planet so yeah that can be the radius of the planet that is not required this is required this is not required and the period of the rotation of the planet uh, this is not required. The time for the satellite to orbit the planet once this is required. Okay, so I think B is the right option, sir. B is the question number 37. B is the right option, sir. Okay. So it's a little tricky question. This is a new question, okay? This is from the space, uh, space physics. Approximately how long does it take for the moon to make one complete orbit of that? That is one month straightforward. Question number 38B is the option. The energy generated in stable stars comes from nuclear reactions. Which type of reaction occur in the sun? This is nuclear fusion in which smaller nuclei fuse into each, each other to make larger nucleus. Helium nuclei join together to form hydrogen nuclei. No, 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 no. Helium is larger than hydrogen. Smaller nuclei 
join together. So hydrogen nuclei join together to form helium. B is the option. B is the right option, sir. Then we have here, he says, question number 40. Two quantities define the Hubble constant, H, H naught. The speed at which the galaxy is moving away from the Earth, uh, that is V, and the distance and uh, of the galaxy from the uh, Earth, D. What is the relationship between V and D? And what is the current situation? The V, the speed at which the galaxy is moving away from that, that is equals to H naught D. This is that formula, okay? So uh, V is directly proportional because the H naught is a constant. So V is directly proportional to the uh, D. So V is proportional to the D, okay. Now, the what is the unit for the, what is the value for the H0? We, you don't have to remember the H0 value. I can tell you, you know, the the H0, let me, let me tell you how do you know that which is the right value, is V divided by D. This is a meter per second. And this is meter. So the unit of the age will be second inverse. Out of these, where the V is directly proportional to D and the value given has this unit. A is the right option. I hope you understand. And uh, let's check. Question number 40, A is the right option, sir. So, my dear students, we are done with this paper. And today, in this paper, uh, today we have done, uh, you see what we have done today. So, today, in this video, this is the first time I'm making, I'm solving uh, uh, physics, uh, Cambridge IGCSC Physics 0625, uh, Extended Physics 22, uh, it's paper. This paper is February, March, 2023. In this video, I have presented you the solution of this MCQ paper. And I've done my best to explain you the concepts. If you find this video useful, interesting, and you have learned something from it, please like this video. Please share the link of this video uh, with, your, uh, with your class fellows, with your junior students, with your teachers. And uh, I think it's a great blessing for me that I can make these videos and touch the life of so many students around the globe. Thank you very much for watching my channel for preparing physics. Have a good day. God bless you all.